Hello, my name is Menendra Luvalia. I am a senior lecturer of clinical genetics at Cardiff Metropolitan University. Uh, my research interests are interactions between our genome and diet. And there are multiple levels of interactions, the way diet influences our genome and vice versa. And it does influence our state of health and disease. Today, I'm going to give you some examples just to introduce you how what you eat affects your genome. Before we talk about these examples, let's just go back of what the genome is. An adult human body has about 50 to 100 trillion cells. And in each of those cells, there are 3.2 billion bases of four building blocks of DNA, A, G, C, and T. So these four bases make the whole of our genome. There are 3.2 billion of them in each cell, and we have trillions of those cells in our body. Within this genome, we have genes. So gene, by definition, is a stretch of DNA that has information to make protein, and proteins perform all the functions in the cell. So if you think of an enzyme, if you think of a structural protein, these are all proteins that perform any function. These 3.2 billion bases that we have amongst the humans, we are 99.9% .9 identical to each other. So there is that much similarity, but each individual is still unique. And these changes that happen between individuals, we call them polymorphisms. And you can think of these as, a, as some spelling errors that are there in the, uh, our genome. Most of these spelling errors, they don't mean much, but sometimes these spelling errors could be defining our health and disease. So if a normal gene is there, the structure is normal and it makes a normal functional protein, that's fine. But if one of the individuals have got a polymorphism or a mutation within the gene, it is possible that the protein that that gene will form could be mutated, it could be abnormal, and it may not perform the right function that it is supposed to perform, or it is also possible that there is no protein being synthesized, so there will be lack of complete protein there. So these kind of changes in the spellings lead to uh, altered physiology of the individual. So if you look, there are the example of three individuals and there are certain bases which have been shown to be different in them. And think of these mutations as spelling mistakes in the sentence. And if there is a spelling mistake, which is the mutation in the DNA, the information that is going to make the protein, and that is you can think that that is the meaning of that sentence could be totally different. So changes in the structure could mean that protein is abnormal, faulty, or a hypofunctional or a non-functional protein. And if that is the case, if the protein is taking part in maintaining health and you don't have that protein, there will be some functional consequences associated with that. So here I have a gene that is making a functional protein. And I've got an example of a receptor on the cell surface. Uh, this receptor is like a lock, which needs to bind to its key. So the ligand that binds to the receptor, when the ligand comes and binds to the receptor, there is a message that goes into the cell and from the cell to the rest of the body. So if we have a functional protein, ligand binds to receptor and we have signaling. At the same time, if somebody has a mutation there, that could mean we are having an altered protein or maybe no protein. And in this case, the receptor shape is different. So the shape of the lock is different. So the lock has been changed now just because the lock where the information was coming to make the lock has been altered due to the mutation. Now the ligand can't bind to this protein, 
And if this ligand receptor binding doesn't happen, the signaling is not going to happen. Thinking about food, I did promise I'll talk about food. So how many of you fall into each of these category? Brussels sprouts, I am in the category B. I find them really delicious. There are people who find them gross, they find them bitter. And there are some who don't mind it. They like to change its uh, flavor by adding some things, but they don't mind it. So if you are in one of these categories, don't worry about it because it is one vegetable that has divided the nation. We do have people who like it and we do have people who don't like it. And you can just simply blame your genes because the ability to taste Brussels sprouts or certain compounds in Brussels sprouts is within our genetics. And that's what I'm going to talk about now. Before we talk about Brussels sprouts and why we like or dislike them, let's look at a little bit of the structure of our tongue and how do we taste. So on our tongue, we have these papillae. Within these papillae, we have taste receptor cells. Taste receptors, they bind to the tastant. When the tastant binds to the receptor, we get the feeling, the message goes to our brain and we get the sensation of taste. Humans can taste up to six tastants. So out of these, some will be familiar to you. Salty, bitter, sour, sweet. The fifth one is umami, it comes from glutamate. And the sixth one, which was most recently introduced to us is the creamy or the fat taste. So depending on our genes, we taste all these taste tints within our diet. And the best studied taste receptor is the bitter taste receptor. Its name is TAS2R38. Uh, it has got three genetic variants. So there are three known mutations which occur in this gene. And on this side, these are the mutations at the DNA level at position 145, 786, and 886 in the gene. These are the base changes that happen. That means the person can have these three amino acids at the level of protein. Remember, DNA has the information to make protein. So we are either with proline, alanine, and valine, or al uh, alanine, valine, and isoleucine. And these three polymorphisms, they generally go together, not 100%, but mostly you will fall within the category of either PAV haplotype or AVI haplotype. So the PAV haplotype, which is on the right-hand side of this figure, gives you a receptor with a certain shape that binds to the bitter tasting chemical quite strongly. So here is the PAV receptor, binds to the bitter tasting compound, signaling goes to brain and you taste the bitter taste of bitter tasting compounds. And I'll come to that in a minute. If the individual is AVI, the shape of the receptor is slightly different. Remember that lock and key hypothesis I mentioned. This receptor shape is such that the bitter tasting compound doesn't bind strongly to this receptor or doesn't bind at all. And the person doesn't taste the bitter taste in their food. In addition to PAV and AVI haplotypes, we also have to think how many taste buds we have. So if you look at your tongue in the mirror, you will see these um, little dots appearing on your tongue. And these are the papillae on your tongue. And we all are different in the number of papillae on the tongue. So there is something called super taster tongue, which the papillae density is quite high, and a non-taster tongue where this density is quite sparse. And it is also within our genome that determines the density of these taste buds. 
So there is a gene called gustin or carbonic anhydrase 6. At one particular position, either individuals are A or G. And G, if somebody has a G, they are associated with this non-tasted tongue of lower papillae density. So if you are a PAV haplotype, which was taster, and if you have a super taster tongue, you are going to be a super taster for bitter tasting compound. And if you are a, a non-taster, if you have a G in this carbonic anhydrase gene and you are an AVI haplotype, you are going to be a non-taster. It's possible that you are a super taster tongue, but with pa, uh, AVI haplotype, then you will fall within the in the middle, you will be able to taste, but not with that same strength. Going back to Brussels sprouts now. Brussels sprouts are rich in these um, bitter compounds called glucosinolates. When we cook them, glucosinolates break down and they give, give us these compounds called isothiocyanates, also for sulforaphanes which are bitter tasting like some bitter tasting chemical compounds. And 70% of the population are taster of these bitter tasting compounds. So I want you to think that if you can taste bitter, bitter tastant, if you are a PAV haplotype, it is possible that you may not like Brussels sprouts or cruciferous vegetables because they are rich in these bitter tasting compounds. And I also want you to think that cruciferous vegetables are not the only natural foods that we eat which are bitter because there are things like grapefruits, which also have these um, bioactive compounds which taste bitter. But these bioactive compounds are supposed to be anti-cancerous, anti-inflammatory, and they have many other health promoting properties. So if somebody is the super taster, they find things better. It is, it is quite plausible that they have a tendency to avoid those bitter tasting compounds throughout their life. And that is possible that they will be deficient of these bitter tasting natural compounds which have got health promoting properties. And that could increase the risk of certain diseases, which has been shown in some cases of uh, metabolic diseases and colon polyps. So what we eat is depending on our genome. The second thing that we generally don't think about in terms of genetics is the level of switching on that happens in these gene, genes. Within our genome, we have about 20,000 genes. Not all the genes are switched on at the same time, at the same level in all the cells. It is possible that we have altered gene expression depending on the functioning of the cell. So in this um, simplified cartoon, I'm showing that Gene B is hardly expressed. It's not making much protein. And gene A is quite highly expressed. So we need genes being switched on at certain time of cell life, at certain cells at certain level. And we do need this gene expression, genes getting switched on to make protein in a balance. So things can go wrong at protein expression level or gene expression level as well. So when I say about expression, what do I mean? So this is our gene, which is shown with this black solid arrow. This is where the information is there to make protein. But to make protein, we also need a region of our genome called promoter. And these are generally quite close to where our genes are. And on these promoters, certain proteins have to come and bind. And these are called transcription factors. 
These are not the same for all the genes, and these could be different in different cell types as well. So we need right combination of these proteins. And for simplicity's sake, let's just call them TFs. They have to come and bind to the promoter. And once the right uh, promoter is occupied by right proteins, the gene expression will be switched on. So that is what I mean when I'm talking about gene expression. Gene is switching on to make protein at certain times. I'm going to take an example of one of the very common diseases called diabetes. Diabetes is a big problem. It costs about 10% of NHS budget every year. There are two types of diabetes, type 1 and type 2. Type 2 is the one where we have insulin is being made, but we have the problem called insulin resistance. So the cells can't use glucose in response to insulin. It is, uh, and type 2 diabetes is the 90%, 80 to 90% of the cases of diabetes. In the UK, about 5 billion people are currently diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, but there is a big uh, population that is at very high risk of type 2 diabetes and lifestyle interventions can help them prevent or delay the onset of this diabetes. One of the drugs that was successfully used to treat type 2 diabetes was rosiglitazone. Going back to that lock and key model where receptor binds to the ligand, Rosiglitazone, the chemical in rosiglitazone binds to a receptor called PPAR gamma. PPAR gamma binds to the promoter region of genes. So if rosiglitazone is given, it activates PPAR gamma. PPAR gamma binds to the promoter region of certain genes and these genes are involved in increasing insulin sensitivity and decreasing inflammation that is the root cause of many complications associated with type 2 diabetes. So you activate PPR gamma, you increase insulin sensitivity via gene expression of certain good genes. It was good. On this graph, it shows that if you give rosiglitazone for certain length of time, even after you stop giving the rosiglitazone, the beneficial effects of rosiglitazones are quite sustained. So on the y-axis here, it is diabetes incidence, and the dotted line here shows the, uh, uh, the population which was given rosiglitazone. So rosiglitazone is a good anti-diabetic drug. It increases insulin sensitivity and decreases inflammation. At the same time, when rosiglitazone was in the market after approval, it was uh, observed that um, there is an increased risk of heart failure in patients who were on rosiglitazone. And this graph, the yellow line is rosiglitazone patients. And on the y-axis here is the incidence of uh, heart failure. And you can see that rosiglitazone increases the risk of heart failure. So after this trial was completed, rosiglitazone was withdrawn from the market. But we knew how rosiglitazone works. It binds to PPR gamma, it activates it. Can we activate PPR gamma by any alternative means? In the last decade or so, a lot of research has gone into it. And we have recognized many naturally bioactive compounds, which are found in nature, which bind to PPR gamma, maybe with not the same intensity as rosiglitazone did, but they are PPR gamma ligands. Those are the keys which do fit into PPR gamma and activate it and bring about the similar beneficial effects as rosiglitazone was bringing. And I want you to pay attention to this sulforaphane. And I did talk about sulforaphane coming from cruciferous vegetables and being a bitter compound. So if somebody doesn't mind bitter tasting compounds, 
they will have sulforaphane in their diet and they will have some sort of activation of PPA gamma and beneficial effects coming from activation of PPA gamma. The literature is full of these examples, but I'm just going to give you one example of curcumin, which is found in the spice turmeric. You can see that curcumin at 12 hours and at 24 hours, it increases the expression of PPA gamma. So diet has a potential to switch on and off our genes. And we can use diet to switch on certain good genes to have the health promoting properties associated with it. Third thing I want to talk is where I'm not going to talk genetics, but I'm going to talk about chemical modifications of genetics. So our genome, remember I mentioned 3.2 billion bases in each cell this genome can be chemically modified. So the sequence doesn't change. So there is no spelling mistake, but the packaging of this changes due to the chemical modifications. And this altered chemical modification, what we call is epigenetics. So something on top of genetics is the literal meaning of epigenetics. Epigenetic changes could alter the gene expression. So it can switch on and off certain genes depending on these chemical changes. The one epigenetic change that has been well studied with the diet interaction is DNA methylation. So our DNA can be methylated at certain points. And I am going back to the promoter region here where transcription factor come and bind. And these empty lollipops indicate that DNA is not methylated. If DNA is not methylated in promoter regions, transcription factors can come and bind here and they can switch on the gene expression. But if within the promoter region, DNA is methylated, so those red lollipops are indicating the methylated part of DNA, these will stop the transcription factor coming and binding to the promoter region. And if transcription factor can't bind, the gene will be switched off. And the best studied example of this DNA methylation in response to diet is this uh, agouti mouse model. These are genetically identical mice that are there on the screen. One of them is lean and darker in color, and the other one is obese and yellow fur. This obese mouse has got increased risk of cancer and type 2 diabetes. But DNA between these two is exactly the same. So the structure of the DNA hasn't changed at all. And what changes is the expression of this gene called agouti gene. If agouti gene is switched on, the mouse is yellow and obese and high risk of diseases. If agouti gene is switched off with the help of DNA methylation in the promoter region, the agouti gene is switched off and the animal is dark in color and lean and of healthy phenotype. One thing that in diet that has been extensively studied in these mice is the use of this chemical called BPA, bisphenol A. This compound is used in plastic industry extensively. You may have seen this BPA free stickers on certain plastics, but what this BPA does, so it's in the plastic, if you leave the water in that plastic bottle, the water gets warm and this BPA leaches from plastic into your drink and you ingest it. And these mice, as you go along from right to left, they are genetically identical. Only thing that is different is 
the amount of BPA in their diet. So if there is no BPA, the mouse is lean. And if there is too much BPA, so you increase the amount of BPA, the mouse is yellow and obese and high risk of disease. I did mention it is due to a gene called agouti gene. Within the agouti gene promoter, remember where transcription factors come and bind, there are nine recognized sites where DNA methylation can happen. So these nine sites, if they are methylated, the gene will be switched off and the animal will be of healthy lean phenotype. And if there is hypomethylation or methylation tags are removed from those nine sites, the agouti gene will get switched on and obesity and yellow fur comes to play. If you increase BPA in diet, you lose the methylation and we get this unhealthy phenotype. But luckily, diet can also reverse these changes. We can take certain methyl donors in our diet. For example, there is folate, there is choline, which provides us with the methyl donors and that methylation tags can be put back on the DNA and the healthy phenotype can be obtained. So diet has the ability to again switch on and off the genes and um, it's a certain chemicals in the diet that interact with our genome to make sure that the so there is a balance between gene expression with the help of epigenetic changes. One last thing is not about the human genome now. Here I'm going to use an example of the microbial uh, genome in our body. So if you look at the genes, human genes that we have, which are between 20 to 21,000, we carry more than 2 million genes from bacteria that lives in various parts of our body, but most of it is in our gut. So the gut bacteria, we call it microbiota, that also interacts with our genome. So it's not just that they're living there, there is interaction between our guests which live in our gut and between our genes. So we, the gut we have, we can classify into two types. Symbiosis, where we have healthy gut microbiota, good diversity of gut microbiota, secreting good chemicals, and the gut is healthy. Or we can have less diversity of gut microbiota, more pathogenic bacteria living in our gut than the good commensal bacteria and that state is called dysbiosis. Our genetics also determines what type of bacteria live in our gut, but our diet is the biggest factor that determines do we have symbiosis or dysbiosis. So I'm going to just use a couple of examples from that. Uh, the bacteria that we have in our gut, two of the biggest phyla are bacteroiditis and firmicutes. This blue one is firmicutes and bacteroiditis, the red one. It's the ratio that matters between firmicutes and bacteroiditis. When they isolated the, the bacteria from people with different BMIs, obese people have got big ratio, big difference of firmicutes to bacteroiditis ratio. So you can see here in obese individual, the ratio is much higher. There is much higher firmicutes as compared to bacteroiditis. And in lean individuals, this ratio is lower. So there is less firmicutes and more bacteroiditis. And so these bacteria, <clears throat> determine the phenotype of the individual. Second thing these bacteria do is they also secrete metabolites. 
and they eat on what we eat on. So if we are eating on dietary fibers, the bacteria living in our gut will eat the same fiber. They will produce certain chemicals, which through the portal vein get into our body through circulation, and they switch on certain signaling pathways. And depending on our diet, and depending on the type of bacteria that we have in our gut, these chemicals can be either good chemicals that promote health or could be some nasty signaling molecules which are not good for health. So high fiber diet has been shown to reduce the ratio between uh, firmicutes and bacteroiditis, which is, that's what you want. And this high fiber diet and good set of bacteria promotes the health via prom release of certain health promoting chemicals. Diet which is poor in fiber, but is rich in animal protein is responsible for increasing this firmicutes to bacteroiditis ratio. So leading more towards the obesity phenotype. And this bacteria also is responsible for this chemical that is secreted by them called TMAO, which is associated with the increased risk of atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease. So our diet doesn't only influence our genome and what we secrete, it also influences our genome and our health via contributing to these changes in gut microbiota. So to bring everything together, our genome, the DNA that we have in each of our cell can decide what we like to eat, what we dislike to eat, and what actually goes on our plate is, has much of an influence on our health via either via altering gene expression directly or via altering gene expression by epigenetic mechanisms or thirdly, by influencing the gut microbiota species that live in our gut and the type of products they will produce. Thank you for listening and I hope you have enjoyed this lecture. Thank you.